It's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them for. I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be wellbeing partner at this year's Festival of Education, and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher in doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly. Welcome to this Festival of Education keynote session, part of the annual Festival of Education, taking place online from the 16th to the 30th of June. This year's festival is free for all teachers and educationalists across education in the UK and beyond. This has only been possible thanks to the support of our incredible partners. A huge thank you to our headline partner, Pearson. Our festival partners, BBC Bite Size, Cognita and Teach First. Our literary festival partner, Bloomsbury Publishing, 
and our organising partner, Wellington College, the home of the Festival of Education. We'd also like to thank our incredible speakers. Over 200 leading educationalists and thought leaders will be providing sessions at this year's festival. On behalf of the audience and organisers, thank you. It's time to sit back and get set for our upcoming keynote session. If you wish to ask a question during this session, please head over to our Slido page to submit questions and vote for your favourites. Enjoy this Festival of Education keynote session. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Carl Hendrick, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce our next speaker, who I think it's fair to say has been a huge influence in education over the last 10 years. <clears throat> Dan Willingham is currently Professor of Psychology at the University of Virginia, where his research focuses on the application of cognitive psychology in the classroom. <clears throat> so without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dan Willingham. Thank you, Carl, and thank you all so much for uh, spending some time with me this afternoon. Really happy to be here. Something uh, uh, This event has been one that I've wanted to attend for quite a long time, so it's wonderful to be here, even if only virtually. So you can see uh, the topic of my talk today is concerns student distraction, uh, and in particular, things that we can tell students to help themselves. So I'm less going to focus on uh, what teachers might do in classrooms, but rather ways that teachers can advise students to try to address the problem themselves. So three topics that I want to take up in the next hour. Uh, first, I want to consider whether students today have a special problem that students in previous generations did not have. Do students today just have shorter attention spans than students in previous generations? Uh, and then I'll take up each of the sort of two different ways that attention can go wrong. Uh, one is mind wandering and psychologists use this term very much the way it's used in everyday conversation, distraction from within where you're trying to focus on something and the next thing you know, your mind is on something else. Uh, and then distraction from without where there's some external stimulus that's sort of dragging attention away from whatever it is you had hoped to focus on. And as you can see, a subtopic with, uh, within that one is why students are so frantic about their phones. We'll, we'll try and tackle that one as well. So let's start here, uh, considering whether or not students today have a special problem with attention. Here's the argument that uh, people have made on this, uh, uh, about this. Uh, the activities that students enjoy on digital platforms all share a particular feature namely that they entail or require very rapid shifts of attention. So if they're watching videos, the dialogue is really fast. There are lots of fast cuts in ways that there didn't used to be in videos 30 years ago. Uh, they're playing action video games where attention flips around a lot. Uh, they've got multiple apps open at the same time and they're flipping between this, these various apps. So the idea is that this uh, moving around very rapid shifts of attention becomes habitual and students have really lost the ability to sustain attention on one thing for any period of time. People have looked at this in the laboratory. There have basically been two families of studies and I'll give you some uh, high profile examples from each type of study. In one type of study, you have students do something um, that sort of mimics the kind of problem that we're talking about here. Uh, and you have you see what the consequences are for attention. Uh, so one of the high profile examples of this was uh, what came, came to be known as the SpongeBob study was actually conducted at the University of Virginia by one of my colleagues, Angel Lillard. So these were four-year-olds and she gave four-year-olds a series of um, measures of controlled attention. I'll get to those in just a second. Then she had them either watch uh, a SpongeBob video for 20 minutes or a control video. It was still animated, uh, but it was much slower paced um, and it depicted sort of a little boy going about his day. And then in a third group, uh, they just did some coloring with markers. 
So here's what the four um, tests were uh, of controlled attention. Uh, and they kids did these at the beginning of the session, then the video or the coloring, and then again at the end of the session. So we're going to be looking at different scores. So briefly, HDKS stands for heads, toes, knees, shoulders. And this is sort of like, I don't know if it's the same in Britain and the States, we call it Simon Says, where it's an imitation game. And initially, you know, if I put my hand on my head, you have to put your hand on your head and so on. And kids Kids by age four already know this game and they enjoy playing it. So then you say, okay, that was really fun. Now we're going to do something a little bit different. Now we're going to do it a silly way. When I say head, I want you to touch your shoulders. And when I say shoulders, I want you to touch your head. So there's this impulse on the part of the child to follow whatever it is the adult says, but they're supposed to recognize that and sort of override the impulse. So this is why it's a measure of controlled attention. Backward digits is a very standard measure of, um, uh, of attention and working memory capacity where uh, you just say backwards a series of digits that the experimenter has said. So if I say 617, you say 716 and so on. Tariff and is kind of a little puzzle. That's a standard working memory and uh, problem solving task. And then delay of gratification was something pretty similar to the marshmallow task, which everybody here is familiar with. So what do we get? Um, and, and again, what I'm going to show you is the graph, the graph is going to show different scores. All the kids did all of these tasks before watching the video. And then again, after watching the video, and this is what the data looked like. Uh, so positive scores mean they did better after the, um, after the activity. Negative scores mean they did worse after the activity than before. And you can see the past based video really seems to incur a cost. So this seems consistent with this idea. Yeah, these videos that kids spend a lot of time watching are really depleting. They're really costing kids in terms of attention and working memory. But when you think about it, there's another interpretation, which is this is very short term, right? That's not, that's not really what the theory is. The theory is this is a sustained effect that doesn't, um, it's not just that SpongeBob makes you briefly tired. It's very believable that watching this really fast paced video would be sort of depleting. It would be exhausting, but that doesn't mean for all time, working memory and attention have been compromised, right? You, you could actually suggest the opposite. You could say, this is kind of practice for working memory and attention. And so you're challenging it and you're making it stronger, right? So this experiment got lots and lots of press at the time. And the interpretation was sort of like SpongeBob makes you stupid. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily true. It's not really the right way to think about exactly what this was studying. And there have been other studies in this, and again, this was 10 years ago, and I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole because there, there have been some curveballs on what all this means. But this is one way people have tried to study it, and again, I think not necessarily the ideal way. The other way to do it that gets a little bit more uh, directly at the question that we're really interested in is whether you are a habitual multitasker. And so what they did in this case, um, this is a group of researchers at Stanford, um, and this was the first study, and again, this is 2009, there's been lots of follow-up work on this. Um, what they did was they asked students, how often do you engage in media multitasking? So how often do you listen to music while you're doing your homework? Or how often do you have the television on while you're doing your homework or doing other sorts of tasks? And what these researchers reported is that high multitaskers do actually have slightly worse attentional control. So in this particular task that you're looking at, as you can see, time goes from left to right. So you get this, the, the little plus there just tells you where you're supposed to be paying attention. And then there's this very brief one-tenth of a second flash of the array of red and blue lines. Then there's a period of almost a, a second where the screen is blank. And then you get this sustained second array that's up there for two full seconds. Your job, if you're a subject in this experiment, is when you see that second array, you're supposed to say whether it's the red bars in particular are the same or different in terms of their orientation than they were in the first flashed array. So here, of course, it's very obvious to us that they're different. Needless to say, when that first array flashes for a tenth of a second, it's much more difficult. The key thing here is they vary the number of blue bars. 
So the more blue bars there are, the more sort of irrelevant stuff you need to keep at bay if you're a subject in this experiment, the more stuff you need to ignore. Uh, and so what you find is the more blue bars are, even though you know you're looking for the red bars, the more blue bars there are, the worse you do at this task. And what these experimenters found is that uh, the LMM stands for low media multitaskers, HMM stands for high media multitaskers. Um, as the number of, initially when the task is relatively easy, everyone's performing about at the same level, but as the task becomes more difficult, you see this divergence. Now, needless to say, this, the interpretation of this experiment is not straightforward either because this isn't a true experiment. This is a correlational finding. So in other words, yes, maybe it's the case that a lifetime of media multitasking makes you a little bit worse at controlling attention, but maybe it's also the case that people who can't control attention very well just like to media multitask and that's what's behind this. So you need to do proper experiments in order to really get at this. That's not easy to do. But again, I just wanted to show you kind of a banner study from this. I will tell you this came out in 2009. Since that time, there's been an enormous amount of work using a number of different techniques. It looks like the right conclusion is you get a very small hit to your ability to control attention if you habitually multitask. It does seem like there's a little bit of a cost, but the cost is really small. It's difficult, it's so small that it's, it's actually difficult to detect. And this is, I think, in keeping with a very broad principle of the brain that we've learned over the last 20 years or so, which is that, yes, the brain is plastic. The brain is, the brain learns and it's open to change. We've all heard that many, many times, but it's not that plastic. So I've got a picture of a diagram here of a, of, of a home to sort of emphasize, if you think about the architecture of the brain, like experience can move the wall a foot this way or that way. It can't take the kitchen and plop it down into another part of the house where the, uh, where the living room was. That's a major change. In other words, it would uh, that, that change was sort of cascade throughout the system and everything would need to be reorganized to make up for that huge change. And if you really uh, change the nature of attention, if you really shrunk attention and kids' ability to, uh, to control their attention, that would, it would basically make kids stupid. It would affect reading comprehension. It would affect uh, problem solving. It would affect their ability to do math and so on. So the idea that, um, yeah, like doing this thing that is kind of uh, hard on attention, the long-term consequences might be negative, but they're probably gonna be pretty small. Give you one other example of this principle, like you can kind of nudge the walls this way and that, but you're not gonna end up with a huge, um, a huge change. This is consistent what with, with what we've seen in the gaming literature. So again, a very heavily studied phenomenon uh, in the last 10, 15 years. Um, the idea being that if you're an action video game player, that actually is gonna have some positive consequences for attention. Uh, in this particular test, they were trying to find something that would be very similar to the kinds of things that action video game uh, players would be really good at. So you can see on the x-axis there, it says number of squares. So this task is basically your ability to keep track of multiple things simultaneously. Um, and you can see the y-axis is error. So as you get more squares, performance is getting worse. Errors are increasing. Uh, and the dark bars are non-video game players. The open bar, uh, sorry, open squares are video game players. So you can see there is a difference. The, the video game players are better at this, this process, that, uh, this task that requires distributing attention. They really are better at it, uh, but they're not that much better. You know, they're sort of a few percentage points better. Uh, and the slopes are the same. So, you know, their, their performance degrades just like the people who never play video games. So I'm showing you this again, just to emphasize, uh, yes, the brain is plastic. Yes, we think there probably is some uh, consequence of the, uh, 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 of these sort of, uh, media multitasking in particular, M maybe more broadly uh, the kinds of things that kids do um, uh, on digital platforms, but this is not a big effect. One final data uh, set of data that I'll show you, uh, published in 2015, looks at backward digit span across decades. So you'll remember this is one of the tasks in the SpongeBob study. 
um, and some enterprising researchers noticed uh, researchers have been administering backward digit span for a very long time. This has been useful um, in psychological science for many, many years. And so they just collected some data sets and made comparisons as they could to be sure that the subjects were comparable. And they found that before and after the digital revolution, backward digit span was roughly the same. So again, the idea that there's been this uh, precipitous decline in uh, adults or kids' ability to uh, maintain attention does not seem to be merited. And when you think about it, the other thing that I like to point out to people is kids really can pay attention for a long period of time. When there's a movie they like or a book they like, um, they don't suddenly sort of get up in the movie and say, all right, well, it's been 20 minutes. And as we all know, that's the length of my attention span. So I guess I'm done here. You know, when something is really uh, interesting to them, they absolutely can stay with it. Uh, and I'll come back to what that distinction might be in a moment. But what I want to emphasize is, yeah, it seems like they can stick with it, but why don't they? So this goes all the way back to 2012 uh, and Pew, uh, Pew Research published a study, a nationally representative sample of teachers in the United States uh, and asked them a bunch of different questions about students today. But the, the question that I wanna emphasize here, this is restricted now to teachers who've been teaching at least 10 years, minimum of 10 years in the classroom. And they just asked them, do you think kids today have a harder time paying attention than kids did 10 years ago or farther back? 90% of teachers said, yes, I think, I think that's a problem. So I'm very reluctant to conclude, oh, that's just teachers thinking everything, you know, back in the good old days, things were different. Uh, I, I absolutely think teachers really are seeing something. At the same time, I've just spent 10, 15 minutes arguing that kids' attention, uh, ability to deploy attention probably hasn't changed substantially. So what's going on here? Is there another explanation for what almost all teachers feel like they're seeing? Well, Deploying attention is not just a matter of span. It's not just your ability to deploy attention. It's also a matter of what you think is worthy of your attention, right? So I said, kids can pay attention to a movie or read a book when they find the movie or book interesting. So maybe what's changed is not kids' ability to pay attention. Maybe what's changed is their criterion of when something is interesting. And in other words, digital technology may have changed beliefs and expectations, not abilities. Um, I want to be quick to point out, I have no evidence that this is true, um, but I think it's genius. So I'll offer it for your consideration. Uh, it may be true. So here's the, uh, here's the idea. Even brief boredom is not normal and it shouldn't take much to prevent boredom. That's the belief. So the idea is that maybe a generation ago, uh, kids were just more, more often found themselves bored without that much they could do about it. It took a whole lot more resourcefulness um, and probably time and energy to become less bored. So in other words, the key characteristic of digital amusement today is not that it requires very sh rapid shifts of attention. That may not be so important. What's important is there's always something else to do and finding something else to do requires very little effort on my part. That's the idea. Uh, so if I'm on Twitter and Twitter's boring, I go to Reddit. If Reddit's boring, I go to YouTube. YouTube even makes it easy for me to, if I find a video boring, it's got a list of suggestions of other things that, that I might want to try, right? So there's always something else to do. I contrast that with what television was like when I was a kid. I mean, there were uh, times when, I mean, today, I, I can't even guess how many channels my television can get. Uh, when I was a kid, there were four channels. That was it. And so if you decided I want to watch TV and, you know, we very much thought of it or certainly our parents told us this is kind of mindless entertainment. Um, maybe so, but like the choices were really limited and you absolutely found yourself watching stuff that you maybe wouldn't have watched. And this is, I think, a key uh, point here is that sometimes you learned that things are a little boring initially and then it gets better. And that sometimes sustained attention when initially you're a little bit bored pays off. This is not something that this sort of a setup encourages you to conclude. 
So in closing this section, I'll just uh, briefly uh, offer one suggestion. This is Jennifer Roberts, who's an art historian at Harvard. She gave a wonderful talk where she talked about uh, this problem in her field, art history, it's absolutely essential to pay sustained attention for long periods of time, because it's absolutely a central tenet of the discipline that if you spend, as you spend more and more time with a work of art, you come to notice more and more things about it. So I won't go through the process, but she, in this talk, I saw her give a talk on this and she later published a paper on it. Uh, she talked about uh, spending an enormous amount of time in her own work uh, for, with this particular piece of art and talked about all the different things she noticed. But in her teaching, what she does is requires that her students go to a museum in Boston and spend three hours looking at a work of art, needless to say, without a phone or a tablet or anything else, just observing the work of art. The whole point of it, as she says, it's the time is meant to be excessive. And students initially are dumbfounded at the idea, but what they learn is that, you know, after 10 minutes, I think I'm not possibly gonna notice anything new about this work of art. And then 40 minutes in, I noticed something else. And then 70 minutes in, I noticed still something else and so on. So this is something that you could think about. All right, let's talk about mind wandering, distraction from within. Psychologists know less about mind wandering than we do about other aspects of attention. We know when it happens and it's not at all surprising when it's likely to happen. The longer you've been doing a task, it happens more with boring tasks. It happens with tasks that are either really difficult or really easy. Why it happens is much less clear. There are a few theories. One is that um, there's some evaluation process in the unconscious that has decided what you're thinking about now is not very important and it starts looking for other things. Other people have suggested uh, this is the natural, wandering is actually the natural state of the mind and therefore, you know, trying to focus attention is putting the brain in an unnatural state. Um, others have suggested you you're want to be sort of toggling between checking in to make sure everything is okay and checking out. And so if you're trying to do too much of one or the other, your brain is going to try and uh, sort of check the other aspect of the environment that you've been ignoring. Now, despite the fact that we don't really understand it very well, we have a few uh, things that we can tell students uh, if uh, they're frustrated by mind wandering. One is don't choose to do it. So there was a fabulous study uh, published several years ago in college classrooms. Um, and what they did, this has long been a technique that's been used. You give students, um, uh, uh, you, you ask students permission and the instructor's permission to text students at a random interval uh, during the class. And when they get a text, that's a sign to them that they're supposed to write down whatever they were thinking about. Uh, typically about a third of students, uh, well, and the, it varies a lot, but on average about a third of students are thinking about something other than the topic of the class. Of those, of the people whose mind has wandered, in, one, in this study they asked students, why is your mind wandering? Why do you think that is? And what they found is 40% of the mind wandering students had chose to mind wander. In other words, they recognize like, oh, I'm kind of thinking about something else, but you know what? Like, this is pretty boring. So I give myself permission to mind wander. Uh, so that's the first thing to think about is if you're mind wandering and you're a little bit frustrated by mind wander, you kind of wish you didn't, don't give yourself permission to mind wander. Second, uh, rest breaks definitely help with mind wandering. That's uh, certainly our, what our intuition would be is that when you take a rest break, you come back refreshed, you come back with the ability to pay attention, um, uh, to stay on task a little bit better. Um, the tomato is here for, um, some of you will already recognize the Pomodoro technique, Italian for tomato is one of the techniques um, by which it's sort of an arrangement of when to take, take rest breaks. I'll just mention, I used the tomato because I wanted to mention, there's nothing about that particular timing that is research-based or indicates is superior to other timing. So you can tell your students, you know, you can definitely adjust how long you work and then how long the, uh, the rest break can be. The other thing we wish we would be able to tell students is here's what you should be doing during your rest break. Um, there's been some research on that. There has not been a clear picture that has emerged. What I always tell my students is a rest break is to make you feel refreshed. So do something that makes you feel refreshed. 
uh, and also, you know, be sensible about what you pick to do during your break. Don't pick something that you're not going to come back from, for example. Another thing you can try, and there's not a research basis for this, but you can suggest, I've tried, I've suggested to my students, some of them say that it's helpful. Um, this comes from mindfulness meditation. For people who are trying to meditate, some of them find it helpful to every 10 minutes or something like that, they'll have a little chime go off on their phone. The idea being sometimes my mind will wander and I won't even notice I'm mind wandering. And so the chime is, will sort of bring me back to focus. Uh, so some of my students have adopted that as a technique that they find helpful when they're trying to concentrate. And then likewise, another um, uh, tip that's not, is not research-based, but is something that some of my students find helpful, and I know that I find it helpful, um, is making good use of task lists and to-do lists. Because mind-wandering, I think the time when you finish one task and when something is finished, that's sort of when you're vulnerable because you, your mind doesn't know exactly where to go next. If you have a to-do list, you kind of know, okay, I'm done with that. It's not break time. Now, now well, let me see what I'm going to do as opposed to sort of scratching around a little bit at loose ends about what, what you should be doing now. Uh, you may be more vulnerable to mind wandering at that point. So you can suggest that to students and, and let them see if it helps. All right, let's talk about distraction from without, um, distractions that come from our environment. And we'll start with this question about students, why our students are so frantic about their phones. First question we might ask is whether or not this is really qualifies as an addiction. This varies by country. There are some psychiatric associations, notably Korea, I think was first with this, who've said, yes, this, this qualifies as an addiction. In the US, they, uh, psychiatrists have not said that um, uh, phone addiction or internet addiction really qualifies as an addiction the way alcohol addiction does or gambling addiction, other sort of recognized uh, problems of that sort. This is the list of criteria that the American Psychiatric Association works with. And some of them look like, you know, gosh, I feel like I've known kids who, um, who probably do meet those criteria. Um, but I, I just offer that for your consideration. There, again, there seems to be some uh, differences of opinion in, among the professionals in the field uh, as to whether or not it really reaches that level. Whether it's an addiction or not, uh, I think Russ Poldrack, a uh, colleague of mine at Stanford University, offered a really useful way to think about why the um, uh, when the phone pings, it's so compelling. He offers an information account. Um, we are wired to seek new information. This is one of the um, leading theories about curiosity now uh, as well. We're curious about things when we sense that there's a maximal amount of information to be gleaned from the environment. Um, and so when your phone, when a phone signal goes off, that's an um, indication that there's new information in the environment for you to acquire. And you know that it's very likely to be personal, personalized to you. It's very likely to be relevant. Um, and therefore, there is a strong urge to investigate it and, and see, what's, see what's going on, what's new in the environment. Now, there's a little more to it. That would be true for all of us. But I think the fact that the information that comes in um, uh, is typically social information is especially important for teens. This is BJ Casey at Yale University. Um, and she's written some very compelling work on uh, how teens think about social information and why social information is so important to them. Uh, and it can be summed up this way, or one aspect of it can be summed up this way, which is this, this sort of hyper sociality on the part of teens is not a bug, it's actually a feature. This is the age at which children are learning to become independent of their parents. They're learning how they, they need to learn how to interact with peers and how to um, operate in a world where their parents are not their main source of information. And so they become hyper-focused on their peers as a way of learning about them. So that gives us more insight into why 
when your phone, when the phone pings, adults maybe are like, yeah, I'm pretty curious to know what that is, but like I can set it aside. Whereas teens, knowing that it's social information, are extremely eager to find out what's on their phone. Now, there's still another aspect of this that I think is relevant here, and this is time discounting. So time discounting refers to the relative reward value of something that, that you're contemplating getting across time. So it's easy, easy to understand this through a simple example. Suppose that you're um, in the grocery store and you've got your little car and you're pushing along and then you see ice cream in the freezer case. And you think, wow, you know, some ice cream would be really nice to uh, have uh, after supper tonight. But then you think, you know what? My doctor told me sugar is not that good. I'm really, I'm pre-diabetic. I shouldn't be having sugar. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get the ice cream. Okay, that's one scenario. Second scenario is you're sitting at the supper table. You've just finished. Your spouse sits down with a bowl of ice cream and says, oh, how thoughtless of me. I got myself a bowl of ice cream and I didn't even ask you if you want any. Here, would you like some of this one? All right, so we've got two situations in which you're contemplating whether or not you should have ice cream. In one case, it's noon, you're in the grocery market and you're thinking about ice cream you know, eight hours hence. And the other, it's ice cream right now, right in front of you. It's easy to appreciate. It would be much harder to turn down the ice cream that's right in front of you compared to ice cream that is you're, you're thinking about getting hours hence, right? That's time discounting in a nutshell. When you're thinking about a reward, a reward that you're thinking about getting very, very soon has more reward value than uh, a reward that is in the distant future. Okay, so how do psychologists study this more formally? This is just a little story I told. How could you actually study this in the lab? Well, what, what you do is you say to a subject, comes in and says, which would you rather have? Would you rather have $10 tomorrow or $10 a week from tomorrow? And the subject says, well, you know, stupid question. Of course, I'd rather have it tomorrow. Well, why? Well, because if I had $10 tomorrow, I could, you know, buy music with it or do something with it. And then I would be enjoying the $10 for an extra week compared to getting a week from now. I say, okay, so that makes sense. So what you really mean then is I need to compensate you. If I'm going to ask you to wait an extra week for your $10, I need to compensate you. So suppose I offered you $11 a week from now versus $10 tomorrow. Now, what do you want? I say, oh, well, I'd still rather have the 10. Okay, well, we can keep going back and forth and I can adjust the amounts of money and I can adjust how long you have to wait for it. And from that, I can develop a curve. And this is called a discounting curve where I'm basically looking at how much you expect to be compensated to wait different amounts of time. So this is a typical sort of discounting curve from the literature. And they have this weird convention. I don't know why it is, but time starts over on the right and the, the future moves leftward. And again, this is weird convention. So this is the value of $28.50. And as you can see at time zero, it's about $28.50. And then the curve drops pretty precipitously. Uh, these are college age students and there is an age effect to the shape of these curves, not really the shape, but the steepness of the slope, all right? So this, again, is pretty intuitive when you think about it. Old people like me, when you say like you have to wait for something, yes, I'm like, I'm a little frustrated. I want, I want you know, it, it has less value in the future, but also I'm old, like I can wait a week. It's no big deal. Little kids, this is impossibly steep, right? So when you talk to a child about getting a reward, but you say you're gonna get it three days from now, that's meaningless to that child, right? There's almost no reward value to a reward that's gonna come a week from now. As every elementary school teacher knows when they've said, if everybody behaves, you can have a pizza party on Friday. Like Friday is the moon, Friday is the Mars, right? Compared to the fun of like poking my neighbor with a pencil immediately. Okay, so why did I go into all this? Went into all this because teenagers do have a steeper discount curve than adults do, right? So things that they're looking at out in the future have lower reward value. Things like my phone pings, I'm thinking of that, the, the opportunity to investigate that as a reward. Now you're asking me to wait. 
right? So some researchers have actually tried to look into this at social information in teens, combining this sort of payoff uh, um, experiment, the, the, the uh, method that I've just described to you, varying time and varying payoffs and coupling it with checking your text messages. And they estimate that a text message loses 25% of its value in 10 minutes and 50% of its value in five hours. Part of this is this discounting thing that I've been describing, that um, thinking about rewards in the future don't have as much value. Part of it, of course, is that social information is perishable. So if everybody knows something, for one thing, I feel really out of it if I don't know at the same time everybody else does. But then also like five hours from now, everyone's moved on to something else. Like it probably, that information literally does have less value five hours from now. So here's the, the sum. Why are students so frantic about their phones? Phones promise new information, which we all value. But phones also frequently promise social information, which is of a special value to students, and that value is rapidly decaying. Right? So it may or may not be an addiction, but this is basically the, the situation. Again, the famous marshmallow test is one thing, but for students trying to uh, wait for a reward, it's not clear they're gonna get two marshmallows at the end of, uh, uh, of the time that they're being asked to wait for their phone. So this is very, very challenging. What can we do about it? Um, I think there is some, uh, some advice that we can give students. And I'll start off with a very useful model from Angela Duckworth and Jim Gross published last year. Um, and this is actually based on a model of emotion processing that Gross uh, came up with. And Angela thought of a way to uh, adapt it to um, distraction from the environment. So you start, start at the bottom of this circle. You, uh, the, the student is in a situation. So in this case, the student is studying. They're doing some work and a phone notification happens, right? So that's the situation. The next thing that's gonna happen is attention might be deployed. So if the student's gonna end up distracted, what's gonna happen is attention is gonna shift from whatever they were working on to their phone. Next thing that's gonna happen is there'll be an appraisal. So I shift my attention to my phone. Now I process whatever it is that's on my phone and I appraise it. So suppose that the appraisal is, this is not that important. Uh, this, I got a text from Becky. The content of the text is not very important, but that makes me remember that I have a snap streak with Becky and I have not maintained my strap, uh, strap <laughs> sorry, snap streak today. Right, uh, and so then I'm, the next thing that's gonna happen is there will be some sort of a response. And so the response in this case is our hypothetical, hypothetical student gets on uh, Snapchat to maintain the streak. And then the student is now in a new situation, which is the student is no longer studying. The student is now on Snapchat and probably will maintain that streak and other streaks and is looking at her feed and so forth. Okay, so this is why is it useful to or break down into these steps. What Duckworth and Gross emphasize is that inhibiting, what you could interrupt the cycle at any point, but as you move around the cycle, that gets more and more difficult. In other words, once you've appraised something as important, it's really hard to inhibit the response. Right? Um, once you've uh, shifted attention, it's really hard to pretend that the appraisal, you know, to change your appraisal and say, well, that, that doesn't really matter to me. That's pretty difficult. The easiest thing, but it's, but it's easier to change your appraisal than it is to change your response. The easiest thing to do, though, is to change your situation. So that's what you really want students to focus on. And there are a number of different ways you can think about changing your uh, situation. So this is uh, uh, the, the make good choices meme, uh, I think is especially appropriate here because a lot of times when parents say make good choices, they're really thinking about the response, right? They're saying like, when you've got that impulse to, uh, to you know, get, stop studying and to get on Snapchat, make a good choice. Don't, don't get on Snapchat uh, and, and instead keep on studying. The really good choice is to change your situation, right? If you, if a, if a parent is encouraging kids to do that, to make a choice at that part of the cycle, you're really setting them up for failure because that's enormously difficult. 
what you want to do is to tell kids, kids, the right choice is the easiest choice, the one that's going to, uh, where you're going to most likely be successful. And that's changing your situation. So what would that look like? Um, first thing to do is obviously choose your location with care. So if you choose the location uh, for doing your work in a place where there are likely to be distractions, like working at the kitchen table uh, or working in a coffee shop, um, it's pr you're, you're going into a situation that is bristling with distractions and you're very likely to find yourself distracted. So this is not a great way to begin a study session. Now, it's certainly the case that, um, oh, sorry, I was got one other thing I wanted to talk about. The other thing in terms of situations is you also want to be realistic. There are, look, the fact that you are bored in a location doesn't mean that that is a good location in which to study. So I've, I've had meetings with students where they were telling me, uh, you know, just sort of casually, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm babysitting. And so, uh, you know, she just usually sleeps. So I'll just study there. And I'm like, you know, it's great to bring a book or another another student was saying like, oh, yeah, my roommate wants me to go to her intramural basketball game. But she just always sits on the bench anyway. So if she goes in to the game, I'll stop studying and I'll watch. Uh, but I'm going to bring my book with me. Uh, now, on the one hand, it's like, great, like bring your book. And if there's downtime, try it and see whether that's really going to work. But if you're planning your study time and you're planning, like, um, you know, I'm not, honestly, I've got four kids. I was sort of like, have you ever sat with an infant before? Like counting on them to sleep seems extremely dangerous. Um, and the same thing with the basketball game. Like these are situations where it's pretty likely you're going to be distracted. So you don't, you don't want to count on that. The fact that you're frequently bored there, again, this is the way I put it to my students. The fact that you're frequently bored there doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to end up being a place that you can count on getting a lot of work done. It's all very nice and good to tell students like, you know, pick a location that's quiet. I mean, it's very standard advice anyway. Um, but that's not always an option for students. And so you, uh, it, it's useful to brainstorm with them. How can you change your space? Okay, like you don't, you don't have a private place in your home to, to work. You have to work at the table. What can you do? What small changes can you make to that space that might help make it um, less, where, where the distractions will bother you less? Um, students like uh, noise canceling headphones. Those are great. I'm a big believer in foam earplugs as well, because with noise canceling headphones, there's always a temptation to turn on music. We'll get to that briefly. Uh, that's not a terrific idea. Foam earplugs are inexpensive. They're very effective. I always carry them with me on airplanes as well and frequently save the day. If you're in a situation where there's a lot of visual distractions, simply turning your chair so that you're facing a wall um, which initially, a lot of times my students are like a little resistant to it, but you know, when you get, when you sort of walk through it with them and say like, you know, why are you sitting down? Why are you, why are you there? You're not, you're, you're not there to socialize. You can socialize during your break. Like, you know, it doesn't mean you can't talk to anybody for hours, but when you're trying to focus, you want to focus. And, you know, you're telling me that this movement is distracting to you. So you can change your space and, and do something about it. Again, choosing distraction. This is some, harkens back to what we were talking about when we talked about mind wandering and that 40% of the people who admitted to mind wandering during a college lecture actually said they chose mind wandering. Choosing distraction in the case of, um, uh, in the case of distraction versus mind wandering is most often media multitasking. So there's been a huge, I mean, just countless studies on the impact of uh, either having video playing or listening to music as you're trying to do academic tasks. The literature on video is extremely uh, consistent, which is I've never seen a study indicating that there are good outcomes with having video on in the background. And what's great about these studies is they try really hard to make this what, what researchers call ecologically valid, meaning they try and simulate 
uh, in the experiment just the way students would uh, actually experience it. So they'll have a chapter of, you know, political science book or something that students aren't studying yet, but is like something that would actually be used in a, uh, in a course. And the task when the student comes in is I want you to read this and take notes on it just the way you would if you were studying, you know, this, if you were taking a, a class. Uh, and then they also ask them to bring in a DVD uh, of whatever it is that they would normally um, watch while they're studying. And they tell them to interact with it the same way. They say, you know, if you usually just have it on, you know, they get to adjust the volume. They say, um, if you normally just feel like you ignore it uh, and just have it on for background noise, then that's the way we want you to deal with it and so on. So they're giving up a lot in terms of experimental control. And, you know, if there's an effect of really knowing what's behind it, but what the advantage of doing the experiment that way is they're really simulating the way that students say that they um, use video at the same time they're studying and extremely consistent results that video, even if it's just on the background, students say they're ignoring it, uh, video, costs in terms of the accuracy of the work they're doing in terms of the time. Music is more complicated. And for a long time, researchers had a really difficult time sorting out what was going on. They thought of all the stuff that you would probably think of immediately like, well, lyrics versus purely instrumental, that's going to matter. Or uh, whether it's upbeat music or down, you know, whatever, all different genres of music. One thing that's really easy is if you actively dislike the music, there's a cost. So that in a way seems really obvious and sort of silly. Um, it's not totally silly though, because if you think about students saying, I'm gonna go to a coffee shop. Well, if there's ambient music and you dislike it, you're, that is gonna be a problem for you. But most of the time when students are in a library with headphones on or at home or whatever, they're picking the music, that's not gonna be an issue. And what researchers found was a lot of variability in these studies. Sometimes there was a cost, sometimes it didn't seem to matter. This is always compared to silence, right? Listening to music compared to silence. Uh, and then sometimes it was actually a benefit, not as often, but occasionally. Uh, the most recent theory, which I think has gained the most traction and is probably right, is that you've got two effect, two conflicting effects that are operating simultaneously. Music is distracting. And so there, there's definitely a cost, but at the same time, music can be energizing or arousing as it's usually described. So this is why people listen to music when they exercise, you know, it sort of, it picks you up and gives you energy. That makes a lot of sense. It also indicates the consequences of listening to music are gonna be really hard to predict because it's gonna be a function of um, sort of your, the student's particular state at the time, like whether they're feeling tired and they need the lift of that music, um, how distracting the music is and so on. So it, music is really a mixed bag. Um, and with students, what I do with my students, I just talk with them about this in some detail. Uh, and say, you know, try and monitor what you're doing. You know, you could you could try to use music wisely. And, and I, I actually think my students um, sort of internal sense is that they are doing this. Like they listen to music when they're like, you know what, if I, if I weren't listening to music, I wouldn't do this work because I really hate this and this sort of keeps me going. Um, but there's not straightforward guidance that we can give students the way we can in some of these other situations of like, this is a very consistent effect. This is what's going to happen. It is worth knowing though, that students in general, there uh, a lot of them are engaged in media multitasking. So what you're seeing here, this is a nationally representative uh, uh, set of data from us tweens and teens. These are the percentage of uh, students who engage in these various activities at the same time that they do homework. So this is self-reported. And then, and as you can see, music in particular among teens, three-fourths of students, they listen to music uh, fairly often when they're, uh, uh, when they're doing their homework. Of, now, this is, this is now this next graph. This is just restricted to those who say they do it. The next question was, do you think that it interferes with your ability to work? Um, and of the students who do it, you can see a very high percentage think this is just fine. This isn't, um, this isn't bothering me at all. Uh, the fact that 79% of teens and tweens say I can text message, I can watch TV at the same time that I'm doing my work and there's no cost indicates to me that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of saying like you could tell students to try and self-monitor while they're listening to music. 
they're they're not that great at self monitoring whether or not TV and text messaging is uh, interfering with their work because it definitely is. Um, so there, we we can't have a lot of faith faith in the, in their ability to self monitor what whether or not listening to music interferes with their work. Unfortunately, part of this I think is that younger people really are better at multitasking. So I think a lot of times younger students feel like the reason. Professor Willingham, that you're telling me not to multitask is that you suck at multitasking and that's because you're old. But uh, I am not bad at multitasking. I'm good at multitasking and therefore, um, you know, I should just be able to do it. Uh, part, there, there are two parts to this. One is whether or not younger people are really better at multitasking and they are. I'll show you some data in a second. The second is whether or not they're better at multitasking because they practice multitasking. They do a lot of multitasking. So I'll briefly tell you about this, uh, this paradigm. This is uh, um, spearheaded by um, Tim Salthaus, who's done lots of these studies in, in, relevant to aging. So if you're subject in this experiment, this is what you see on a screen. Each quadrant contains a different task. You have to do all four tasks simultaneously. So in the upper left quadrant, those that set of letters periodically changes and then the target letter by itself there also changes and you have to use a mouse to click yes or no to say whether the target is part of the set. In the upper right quadrant, that's an, an addition problem and you have to click on the pluses and minuses so that you get the proper sum. In the lower left quadrant, that line periodically drifts to the left or the right. You have to use your mouse to capture it and drag it back to the center. You're do while you're doing all this, you've got headphones on that are playing high-pitched, low-pitched, and medium-pitched tones periodically when the high, uh, the high pitch one appears. Uh, as quickly as you can, you have to race over to the lower right quadrant and uh, click high sound report. If all of this were not frightening enough to you, that number in the center tells you how it's going, how well you're doing. All right, so this is extreme, this is multitasking sort of going off the rails. Uh, these are data from 20 year olds and 69 year olds on average. Um, up is good in this graph and you can see this is progress across days. People do get better at handling all these tasks simultaneously. I show you this graph to emphasize young people are much, much better at multitasking than older people are. So young people are not wrong, but you already saw data uh, indicating that when I when we talked about multi to media multitasking over time, right at the very beginning of the hour, I was talking about the fact that people who are habitual multitaskers are actually slightly worse at controlling attention than people who don't. Theory is that this, this habitual spreading of attention leads to a habit of spreading of attention. That's actually in some circumstances a good thing. For example, in action video games, it is useful to spread attention wide. Most of the time it's not. So the idea that young people are good at multitasking because they have lots of experience multitasking is almost certainly wrong. Young people are good at multitasking because they're young. Uh, and uh, I'm given the time, I'm not gonna go through this, but what uh, follow-up work has indicated is it's working memory. Young people have good working memory. Good working memory um, leads to better performance in multitasking environments. Uh, so it's just vir by virtue of being young that's doing it, not practice in multitasking. The other thing to tell students is that multitasking always carries a cost relative to uh, working, um, uh, working on one thing at a time. And again, that's uh, the, the media multitasking with music as a possible exception. That's a complicated story. Under any other circumstances, there's always a cost. Uh, and the reason for this, this was, this has actually been known for a couple of decades now. There was some wonderful work through the 1990s showing that what you're really doing is, is switching, you're not sharing. Um, we really can focus on one thing at a time. Uh, we can switch very, very rapidly, uh, but we're always switching and switching always carries a cost. So the way this was examined, this is sort of classic study by uh, a series of studies by Hal Pashler and colleagues at University of California, San Diego. So if you're a subject in this experiment, you're told um, you can see that on each trial, you're going to see a digit number, sorry, a digit letter pair. Uh, and when it, the 
Uh, there are four quadrants where that pair might appear. Uh, when they appear in one of the two bottom cells, I want you to pay attention to the number and you've got two buttons in front of you. Press this one on the left if it's an odd number, press this one on the right if it's an even number. But if it appears in the top row, ignore the number and pay attention to the letter. And now the two buttons mean vowel consonant. So the point here is that this is a very, very simple decision, but you do have two different rules that you need to keep in mind. So what's interesting about this is that there is a switch cost. So uh, this time is moving in this direction here. So we start off here, I'm supposed to make an odd even trial. Now the next one pops up here. So I need to ignore the number and pay attention to the consonant. Now in this next one, this is a repeat, right? So I'm still on vowel consonant, then this one switches again, uh, and I need to uh, pay attention to the number. And what you find is response times are faster on repeat trials than they are in switch trials. The thing I wanna emphasize is this is an incredibly simple rule. You do have two tasks, right? Vowel consonant, odd, even, that's two tasks, but the tasks are really simple and making a judgment for college students between odd and even and making a judgment between vowel and consonant, those are way over learned. They're really, really good at those. Nevertheless, there's still a, a, a switching cost. And so what this indicates is you can't keep two tasks in mind at the same time, even if they're very simple. You get the switch cost because you have to sort of regroup and think, okay, now I'm, now I'm doing the number thing or now I'm doing the letter things. I've stopped doing what I did before. Right, so this is why multitasking always uh, always leads to a cost, um, and you know sort of everyday problems. If you're trying to text with uh, some friends at the same time that you're writing a paper for your English class, you have the same sort of switching. You have to you use different ways. You're, you're talking about different topics. You have different ways of communicating. And so you're sort of switching the rules of the game in the same way that you're switching between uh, numbers and letters in the task that I just showed you. Limiting screen time is, uh, I think, an obvious measure to take here. Um, uh, we can go into this further in the Q. That's a horrible image I just picked for this. Sorry about that. Uh, let's get that guy rid there. Another thing you can tell um, students to do if you're, especially with older students, if students say, I myself am frustrated and I'm having a hard time sort of staying off uh, social media. I believe everything you're telling me. I'm still, I still can't do it. Um, you can suggest to them one of the many apps where you can either um, actually limit, make a decision about how much time you want to spend online uh, and then your, your access will be limited. Or if that seems a little too intense to them, they can start off with something that just monitors it and gives them a weekly report and they see what they've done. Final thing uh, before we close out here, I wanna at least uh, suggest some things that students can try if they find themselves in this situation where like they didn't really change their situation and now there, there is a distraction and they're in that position where they're sort of appraising, all right, this is uh, my snap streak. What, what do I do about it? Um, one thing you can, suggest that they do, um, and this is work by Ethan Cross, who's got a fabulous book out in the last uh, few months called Chatter uh, about self-talk. Uh, they can try some emotional distancing talk. So in other words, um, talk about yourself in the third person and say, okay, Dan, now you're really eager to get on Snapchat, right? So notice I'm talking about myself as if I, as if I am someone else, as if I am sort of viewing my problem from a distance as if I'm talking to a friend. And the idea here is to make it less emotional so that I don't feel the urge uh, so, um, so distinctly about wanting to get on uh, Snapchat. Okay, Dan, now you really want to get on Snapchat so you can extend your streak. At the same time, you've got this quiz tomorrow. That's important to you too. In other words, doing some sort of self-talk here with this third person perspective you can suggest to your students they try that. That might help. Um, another thing you can uh, ask your students to do is evaluate the difference between wanting versus enjoying. So this is a distinction. This is especially relevant to dopamine, which for many years, everybody thought dopamine is like the pleasure chemical. 
Um, a more contemporary hypothesis is that dopamine is the wanting chemical. So you see dopamine all the time when a rat, for example, is really enjoying something, getting a, a desirable food item, for example. Uh, but what, the, what that's really, the presence of dopamine in that circumstance really means not just, wow, this is great. It actually means I want more of this. And so the theory is that, and I think this is really true for a lot of my students, Initially, some of the activities they do online are really, really pleasurable. And so they get pleasurable, they get pleasure, and at the same time, they get, they learn this is something that I want. The pleasure actually diminishes over time, but the wanting signal doesn't. So in other words, they feel this urgency to get back online, but then once they're going through their feed, if you ask them, are you having fun right now? Like, is this awesome? They'll say like, it's actually not that great. Uh, and this is something you can think about having a conversation with some of your students um, uh, about this topic. It's, it's certainly one that I've, I've talked with my kids about it as well, as well as some of my students. It doesn't always sort of take hold, uh, but for some students, it really does. They recognize like, it isn't that fun, like once I'm doing it. And having that realization can sometimes, not always, but can sometimes uh, make a difference for students and change their appraisal uh, at that moment. Okay, so uh, back to, this is back to my uh, uh, initial slide, just to remind you what, what we've done. And I know I'm slightly over what time I want it to be. I'll close with some contact information. I'm always happy to continue this conversation uh, over email or on social media. And thank you all very much for your attention. Dan, thank you so much. That was fascinating. As, uh, as the father of a three-year-old, uh, I found myself nodding along with much of that. So we have some questions coming on Slido. <clears throat> if you go to Slido, use the hashtag EducationFest, we'll get some uh, questions coming in. Dan, I got a quick question. You mentioned this idea of um, us being wired to seek uh, new information. It seems to have been weaponized by social media companies. Um, what age do you think, it's a good question many parents ask, what age do you think kids should get a mobile phone? So the first thing I'll say is there, I, I don't know of a research-based answer to that question. Um, if one, if one is even possible, right? I mean, it, it, it depends on your goal as a parent. Uh, but the way, so the way I'll answer that is I'll tell you what, what I did. Um, obviously my, what my wife and I did not, not myself alone. Uh, we held off as long as we could. We also recognize, and I hear this from parents all the time, like there's a social cost, you know, because my, my kids, everybody else has phones. Um, in general, I'm not super moved by that uh, because my answer to my kids is always like, I have no idea what their circumstances are and, you know, what their, uh, I never know what other people's circumstances are. That may be the right decision for their family. It's not necessarily the right decision for our family. Um, we sort of looked for times when it seemed to make sense. So there were specific uses that my kids wanted to put their phones. So one of them got very, very interested in cooking and baking and wanted to follow chefs on Instagram and so on. That was the trigger for her to get an Instagram account. Same thing happened with, um, with getting mobile phones. It ended up being uh, eighth grade, I think, or maybe seventh grade for, for both of my kids. And candidly, I've forgotten what the triggering event was, but as so, you can sorry, imagine, Dan, what, um, what age is that just for, for people uh, outside of the U S yeah. So like 13, 14, right. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. U S centric response. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that, uh, but I, I think the key thing was, it was like, uh, our, our take was, the fact that other kids are doing it doesn't really mean that much because that, you know, that's not our family and we're, we, we do what makes sense in our family. Um, and, you know, it may make sense. Like all of my kids, are, all of my friends are communicating in this channel and I'm being excluded. Like that's a valid reason. Right. But the fact that other kids have it, that itself did not strike me as a valid reason. And again, none of this has anything to do with psychology. This is all just, me talking right um so a couple of questions here have come in uh first one from avin uh do you think meditation can be used to increase attention span yes yeah so i didn't mention it but um there is really good evidence that mindfulness meditation 
is good for mind wandering in particular. So we talked about distraction. We talked about mind wandering. It seems to be especially helpful for mind wandering. Okay. Uh, next question. Would it be effective to develop situational interest in order to focus students' attention on the task? I guess maybe we could expand that to say teaching is often about sort of getting kids to be interested in things that they're not normally interested in. Yes. And you were, you mentioned the fact that students can focus on things that they deem worthy of attention. What should teachers be thinking about in terms of fostering that interest? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I, I, absolutely, I agree that situational interest of, the, uh, of that sort is critical. And I feel like that's, you know, and every teacher already appreciates that's an enormous part of their job is here's this curricular item. I agree that in, it is in my students' long-term interest to know about this. Nevertheless, I don't think they're going to be especially interested. Now, what do I do? Um, how do I find that entree? Um, and the, the, what I've written about is, the, is uh, to me, the key thing is to try to get at what the question is that lies behind the content that we would like students to know. So the, the way I put it is the whatever it is that's in the curriculum is really the answer to a question. And the first thing to do is to figure out what the question is and then find some aspect of students' current interest, current life, or whatever it is that's an entree to the question. And uh, the reason I like that solution so much is that um, other approaches that try and key on students' interests feel a little bit surface to me. It's like try the and and can feel strained. So uh, I think I use an example in, in in one of my books. It was actually a teacher who was um, one of my daughter's teachers was uh, talking about something in geometry and was trying to make it interesting with you know contemporary references to singers or something like that. And it just didn't really have very much to do with math. Um, and so I feel like a lot of times it it ends up being really strained. Um, but if you can figure out what the real question is that is like in the discipline, then you're really getting to the heart of what the discipline's all about. And I feel like, I mean, it's not always uh, easy to do that. I'm not pretending that it is. Um, but that's what I've always taken to be my goal um, because I feel like that's much more enduring. And the truth is I find, you know, it frequently takes a lot of work on my part to figure it out and then figure out a way to shape it for students that's going to be interesting. Um, but it, 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 I think it's mostly possible because the things that are important enough and enduring enough to end up in a school curriculum are sort of classic questions that humanity has wondered about for a long time. Yeah. Uh, one of the sort of live debates over here at the minute is whether or not schools should ban uh, mobile phones. Yeah. Uh, when I think about my own youth, I, there's nothing I can think of when I was a kid and I played video games and listened to music a lot. The, the, the affordances of those things seem radically different than what kids today are being faced with in terms of the, the, the kind of hyper nature of the distraction. So right. if you play a video game, it's, it's in a particular time and space. But tech, with social media, it seems to transcend that. And the distraction seems to be a lot more pervasive. Um, do you think that schools should, uh, what should they be really thinking about in terms of limiting um, students' use of phones? And should they indeed ban them? Uh, I have seen successful models where students have free access to their phones all the time. I think that's really hard to do, um, but I don't want to pretend that it's impossible. And certainly that's not a data oriented answer to the question. It was like data shows it's absolutely impossible to do this correctly. Um, I think it can be done, but I think it's very difficult. And it's, it really is part of a much larger effort at um, a particular type of student culture, uh, school culture. What I've seen much more frequently is where they try it and it doesn't work at all. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, uh, you're, what, ends, what ends up happening is teachers are really put in the position of policing use of the phones. And so the idea is students have access to their phones, but with an agreement that they'll only use them in a certain manner or something like that, or for certain sorts of tasks. Uh, and then the teachers feel like they're con they know the students are constantly breaking that rule. And so they're, they're, they uh, become a police force. That's what I've seen much more frequently. 
the the main thing um, that I encourage school leadership to think about is consistency, because I think the worst of all possible worlds is to leave the is not to have a blanket school policy, but instead to leave it to individual teachers. Uh, because then what happens is you have some teachers who are laissez-faire about it because, you know, candidly, some of them just, they don't want to mess with it. And that's the root of least resistance. And then others are saying like, okay, they're, you know, the phones go in the pockets at the, at the start of class. So then the students who are in the classes with the, with the teachers who are asking them not to use it feel very deprived because now they know lots of other students in the school are at this very moment texting one another and are on social media and so on. Um, and so that's, that leads to an enormous sense of, of, of missing out. Uh, and so that, that seems to be the, the worst of all possible worlds. I think it's really essential that school leadership show leadership and um, uh, have a, a, a consistent policy. And if there's gonna be a policy uh, where the, the teachers end up having to be the police force to ensure that the policy be followed, it should probably be, the policy should be rethought um, because teachers have enough to do without um, trying to enforce a policy like that. Right. Here's a uh, little bit more technical question. Interleaving is positive from memory, but does involve switching tasks. Does this mean that multitasking could be positive if tasks are both educational? Yeah, but sw interleaving is usually uh, the switching is is much longer term, uh, and so uh, you don't get the same sort of problem there. The other thing is, you know, interleaving is not uh, uniformly good for memory. I think there's a little bit of uh, misunderstanding about that. Interleaving is especially uh, effective for certain types of memory tasks. It's not like anytime you're studying, you should interleave, you know, do 10 minutes of working on your art project and then 10 minutes of math problems. That's probably going to lead to more trouble than it's worth. Sure. Brain breaks um, for three to five minutes during the lesson. How effective do you think they are in the long run? Not quite sure what that means, but maybe you can make sense of it. Well, you know, it sounds to me like it's sort of saying, I, you know, uh, the teacher is saying, I, I've, I, or the questioner is saying, I, I see cost benefits here. Like if I do it in the middle of a class, like I'm losing instructional time. Uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly what was being asked, but that sort of makes sense to me. And to me, a lot would depend on, you know, the age of your kids, what you've asked them to do and your own sense of like, are we falling apart here? And we, we need a brain break. Um, I think most teachers are going to have a pretty good sense of like, okay, they've had it and they, they, you know, we either need to do something else or we need, we need to do uh, um, a brain break. And that's the other thing I would mention. Uh, and I didn't mention in the talk because there's less data on it. But another thing you can try in your classroom is instead of a brain break where it's like everybody just like, you know, do some deep breathing or whatever, um, sometimes switching to a, to a new task is enough. And, you know, it will sort of re-energize everybody. Um, uh, so you could, you could think about that as well. But in terms of, um, you know, is, is that three minutes rest break really worth it in my class? I would say, you know, use your own judgment. You, you, you probably have a pretty good sense of, of what your students need. And if you feel like, I'm not so sure I do, then, you know, try it both ways a couple of times and see what happens. Great. Uh, Dan, we're out of time. I just briefly wanted to mention your book, uh, Why Don't Students, Why Students Don't Like School. Why Don't um, Students Like School. Why don't, right. There's yeah. a new edition uh, that's just come out over here. Um, do you want to briefly mention, I think there's, you, you wrote two extra chapters in that book. Uh, there's actually one extra chapter. It's one, on right. technology. So some uh, bits and pieces of what you saw here are, are in that chapter. Um, but there's some other features that are there. The intelligence chapter has been pretty significantly overhauled. The conclusion is the same, but there's a lot of new research that I go over. There are discussion questions in it that I didn't have in the first edition. There's a glossary. Uh, and in general, it's just absolutely fabulous. You'll all want two copies at the very least. So I encourage you all to. For the love of God, buy this book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, thank you so much. It was my pleasure, Carl. Thank you. Bye-bye. It's my great honor to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me.
have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them for I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. Around. It's easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be Wellbeing Partner at this year's Festival of Education and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly. Thank you.